Hey everybody, welcome to the Single Tracks Podcast. My name is Jeff, and today my guest is Mike Repiak. Mike is the Director of Planning and Design at Trail Solutions, which is the trail development arm of the International Mountain Bike Association. He's been involved in recreation planning and trail network design for many years and is currently based in Madison, Wisconsin. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jeff. Really excited to be connecting with you. Yeah. So tell us, how did you get interested in trail planning? A lengthy story, but it's a good, it's a fun story. <laughs> yeah. You know, like a lot of us out riding bikes, we've been, you know, outdoor recreation enthusiasts all our lives. And that's definitely the case uh, with me. Mm-hmm. was out on my, you know, BMX bike as a kid playing around on trails that I built with cousins and friends and stuff. And then also got into uh, snow skiing with my parents. And uh, through that, just uh, became an enthusiast of trails. And uh, when I... Went to college. I started out as a mechanical engineer and changed my major after a few years here at University of Wisconsin Madison, and uh, changed my major to landscape architecture. Okay. Funny, I go back through all my project work that I did. I actually just cleaned a bunch of old files out and stuff, and I wove trails into every project that I could, <laughs> uh, even before thinking I'd end up in the career that I've I've had since. So um, out of college, I just took my passion for outdoor recreation and skiing and moved to Colorado. Oh, cool. I lived in, Bre- lived in Breckenridge for 15 years, designed ski resorts for a company called SE Group. Uh, their previous name was Snow Engineering. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're the go-to uh, ski resort planners and now mountain, mountain resort community planners uh, across the U.S. and internationally. Wow. So as, uh, as ski resorts uh, realize they can't just operate on the funds that they, you know, the revenue they generate in the winter and looking at more of their shoulder seasons and obviously their summer seasons. Mm-hmm. And as they became like more and more like programming that, uh, I was able to take uh, my trails passion with mountain biking and uh, bring that into that work too. So we were doing multi-season recreation plans for results all over North America, resorts all over North America. And uh, that allowed me to kind of take my creativity for all outdoor rec and make it happen there. So yeah. uh, I was with SE Group through 2014. And then uh, my wife and I wanted to get back to the Midwest, uh, born and raised in southern Wisconsin, and missed being on the lakes and uh, friends and family in the area and going to Badger games. So I mm-hmm. uh, moved back and I worked for Wisconsin DNR within the State Parks Department as a trails coordinator in northern Wisconsin. Hmm. Uh, did that for a couple of years. So I, I got the, the public, uh, um, you know, government official <laughs> role for a little bit, uh, which was enough for me after a couple of years. But uh, then the opportunity for IMBA came up in 2016 and always looked up to IMBA and the work they were doing and active in the chapters that I was always living nearby mm-hmm. and uh, been with the role as a uh, director of planning and design with IMBA Trail Solutions for the past uh, well, five and a half years. Okay, cool. Well, I'm I'm fascinated by the idea of like ski resort planning. I mean, is that, it seems like that's maybe, is that more involved than, than trails? I mean, cause obviously you have like the slopes and, you know, like the recreation side of it. But then as you mentioned, there's like all the other, the real estate and the like infrastructure that surrounds that. So were you doing a mix of both of those things or were you focused on like one side more than the other? Um, doing a mix of a lot of things there. I first started out on the land planning side of the organization at SE mm-hmm. Group with my landscape architecture background. Mm-hmm. But my again, my passion for outdoor rec and skiing was really coming through. So I moved over to the mountain planning side uh, pretty quickly. And uh, but those programs, those departments work together quite a bit because you have to have that seamless. Uh, guest experience from uh, arriving at the resort to being up on the hill and apre ski and whatever else. So um, it's small firm, so we all worked really well together, and it's it's very involved. Um, similar to mountain bike trail planning, there's a lot of aspects to it too that the general user um, obviously isn't aware of because there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff and how you can kind of manage their experiences through design. So yeah, we were looking at uh, uh, you know the capacity of transportation systems to get you to the resort uh, between buses, parking, other lifts for transportation to sizing all the facilities in the base area and on mountain facilities, uh, according to the lift capacity that was there. Uh, I think a lot of my coworkers here at IMBA probably uh, get sick of me saying SE group this, SE group that, but mountain resort industry is really 
similar niche, obviously a bigger industry than what we're in with trails, but um, there's a lot of parallels to the two. It's kind of mm -hmm. eerie how much SE Group is similar to what we do at Trail Solutions. And it helped really set the path for what Trail Solutions is now, bringing my knowledge from uh, as a private consultant in the resort development world, coming to IMBA, and uh, uh, we've, we've grown our planning and design side of the the operations uh, to be functioning like a uh, consulting firm. So yeah, uh, yeah. the capacity model spreadsheet that you do for mountain resort planning, it's 20 plus tabs um, that uh, link together lift capacity to trail capacity, to uh, ability level breakdown, to square footage per capacity for all the different aspects of um, base facilities and on-mount facilities. It's pretty, pretty comprehensive. And I've applied some of that to uh, what we do with trails too. Yeah. Yeah, really cool. Right. So we're going to be getting into sort of how you think about the trail experience and how that's designed and everything. First, I want to talk, though, about trail solutions. A lot of people might not be familiar with uh, exactly what trail solutions does. So how is trail solutions related to IMBA and, and what exactly is the role at yeah. trail solutions? Absolutely. And I'll even start from kind of the the history. Um, I'm going back a few years with everything we've been talking about so far, but uh, Trail Solutions really kind of stemmed out of uh, the IMBA Trail Care crew. Uh -huh. you know, in the mid-90s, Trail Care crew was out there with was husband and wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, or just a couple that were in a Subaru going weekend, <laughs> week out, uh, yeah. training local volunteers on sustainable trail building. And they were learning as they were doing it too. And out of all the knowledge that was gained amongst those handful of Trail Care crew uh, couples, uh, the resources that they're coming up with on what works, what doesn't work, uh, turn into the Imba Trail Solutions book. Uh, mm. That is the go-to guide for land managers, federal agency partners, um, you know, local builders, volunteer builders, professional builders. It's it's the Bible for um, setting that foundation. Um, yeah. And while that book was being developed alongside other um, builders in the the industry, uh, those that were still working at uh, Imba. Uh, came together and created the Trail Solutions program within IMBA. Hmm. So it's assault. essentially you can consider us turn turnkey consultants from mm -hmm. visioning, planning, and design to then going to construction. And we have ten planners on the planning and design team, mm -hmm. and uh, we have three build crews. Uh, so I have my co-director and Josh Olson, who's our director of construction and operations. Mm -hmm. So between the two of us, uh, running the program is essentially the fee for service arm of IMBA, the nonprofit. So okay. revenue we generate goes back to just funding IMBA, uh, very mm -hmm. similar to other nonprofits that have that fee for service, uh, programming within it. Cause we're all experts in, in what we're doing. And it's a way to, uh, help uh, keep the organization going strong mm -hmm. with the resources that we're providing to chapters, to land managers, and then as consultants too. Yeah, that's a really important model um, for IMBA, obviously, and one that I think maybe people don't quite understand still, right? Like a lot of mm -hmm. us maybe think, uh, you know, IMBA is like, you know, just funds themselves off of like member donations, you know, the $35 a year or $50 a year or whatever it right. is. But that, I mean, that's not nearly enough to fund all the programs and the things that, that IMBA is trying to do. Um, and yeah, trail solutions, it seems, I mean, that's, that's gotta be the biggest source of revenue for IMBA, is it not? Uh, so actually our funding is kind of, can be thought about in three equal parts between our, our membership dues uh, that is split between us and the local chapter. Mm -hmm. uh, so the dues that we get help um, in the administration of uh, the chapters with their their membership and mm -hmm. creating resources for them. Uh, the other third is our development team. So between David Weens and Patrick Kell, uh, they're out working with uh, donors, maybe other philanthropic organizations or um, single donors. Mm -hmm. uh, some of our, our biggest donors, we call them major donors that are in our single track society that we put okay. a few events on a year and visit uh, locations where we've had a big impact on the community or where Trail Solutions has gone and built trails so everybody gets to ride stuff that we've created. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece is the revenue that Trail Solutions generates. Okay. So um, it's uh, not as heavy to one direction of the three. Uh, in past years, it kind of ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, we're, you could say it's pretty much equal across those three. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so trail solutions too, it's not just like trail building, right? Like part of that is the planning and the design and, and all of that. And the design, that's kind of more the area where you are. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. I'm on the, the front end, you could say, on the, the visioning, mm-hmm. uh, the planning, and the, the design. Uh, we typically have about 40 to 45 active projects at once oh, wow. in that planning and design realm. And uh, in a year, we might build anywhere from five to seven projects. Okay. So um, that kind of gives you a scale of, of the two. Mm-hmm. And uh, our planning projects range from community-wide feasibility studies, uh, you know, identifying mm-hmm. where trail development could occur, uh, to then jumping into design on specific properties. Uh, we also um, work with other partnerships with other groups out there. Um, great project that we just got an approval on in central Wisconsin, uh, Rib Mountain State Park, did a, a planning exercise that was a multi-season. So it had a winter um, component to it and a summer component. So we mm-hmm. actually worked with SE Group on developing that. Oh, uh, but the, the local community partners were spectacular. The Greater Wausau Prosperity Partnership, their uh, CVB, and the local IMBA chapter, and the DNR themselves. Uh, just a great group of par- partners together. And it's kind of facilitating everything that's going on with that to get a cohesive plan coming together. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, so you and I spoke last year, actually, I was working on a story about trail hubs and you said something that was fascinating to me. And and actually is the reason that I was like, we got to do like a podcast and, and talk more in depth. But you said, we have a lot of things in our toolbox to have people interface with a trail in a manner that they don't actually realize we're manipulating their experience. And so Instantly, I'm just like, well, what are the things in that toolbox? Like, how are you able to kind of guide people's experience on the trail? And maybe we could start first by talking about trail hubs briefly. We've covered it already, but just the idea of like how you lay out a trail, how does that kind of influence uh, how people experience a trail system? Yeah. Um, how much time you got? We probably could talk a couple <laughs> days on that, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when we come into trail design, uh, we're first talking about experiences and experience goals Mm -hmm. rather than talking about mileage goals. Hmm. So the landscape really uh, tells us what we can put on it when we start talking Mm -hmm. uh, the experiences and uh, looking at the range of ability levels that we're shooting for too, from beginner to advanced. Or maybe we're doing just an advanced uh, jump park, um, which we have a project right now that will be opening up this coming spring that we can talk about. Between the landscape and the experiences that we're looking to provide, we'll start to see how the structure of the trail network uh, comes out. Is it a stacked loop system? Is it what we call hubs and clusters, like Mm -hmm. you and I talked about a few months ago? Hubs and clusters first came out of more kind of gravity-specific trail networks, or at least we had some vertical to them. So um, you might have a group of four or five riders at the top but you have a range of ability levels in those riders. Mm -hmm. And if you provide a a beginner route that goes down the hill, intermediate route to an advanced route that goes goes down the hill, especially at a ski resort, you might uh, then bring them together down at mid mountain at the mid mountain restaurant, or there's Mm -hmm. an intersection with uh, a mountain road that we only want to cross once forces us to cross in one location. Mm. And then those trails can disperse out again by their ability level and come back in again at the base area Mm. and more complicated, the mountain or more complicated, the landscape, you might have more of those nodes where everybody gathers. Right. So that's the hubs. And the clusters are the, the trails going from hub to hub. Mm. So um, that's where Joey Klein, who's been with Imba Trail Solutions for over 20 years, uh, Joey, I think he coined that term, hubs, hubs and clusters. Okay. Uh, or at least I'll give it to him. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah, there's there's networks that kind of poise out that way, or there's ones that uh, uh, work well in a stacked loop system where you have the beginner trails first that get you out to the intermediate trails that get you out to the expert trails. Mm-hmm. Um, but every project to project is different, you know, site conditions, uh, um, nothing, nothing's exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause you know, I mean, I think that's something that a lot of us maybe don't realize is that you do start with that idea of building an experience, right? Like, I don't know, to me anyway, in my mind, it's like, it's like just a logical thing where you're just like, oh, I got a I'm piece of paper. I'm going to draw out the map. It's going to all like, you know, logistically flow together. But really what you're talking about is considering like, social stuff like how do people ride together and where do they want to congregate and how do they want to choose the trails for their abilities and so 
to me, that's, that's really fascinating. And I think it shows too in modern trails. I mean, the trails that we have today, they seem to be as much fun or, or more fun than the ones that were built, you know, many years ago before we kind of understood all of that. Is, has that changed at all? Like over the years, is that kind of evolving? Like how you think about trail design? It, it has planning and design is a step that you just can't skip. Hmm. And, you know, in the past trails just kind of happened maybe without mm-hmm. a whole lot of forethought, you know, back in the eighties, early nineties, we were out there and just riding straight up and down hills and uh, just look for that cool terrain, go look for that rocky stuff, make it as technical as we can. Um, but planning and design, it's great. We get uh, uh, feedback from clients. They're like, yep, we're glad we did spend that money and mm. thought it through because we mm. wanted to go over here and build trails first. But in your plan, you showed that actually that made sense more for our, our third phase Mm-hmm. Or we didn't really think about this location. You know, how did you guys land on top of that? So we get some great testimonials from folks that have been through our whole process. Mm-hmm. And uh, that helps overall in our conversations with other clients, like planning and design. Got to start there. Can't skip those steps. Mm-hmm. It makes yeah. you think through a lot of things. You know, we start at that, that planning, the high level planning exercise is looking at access points and emergency ingress and egress Mm -hmm. Uh, we're looking for positive and negative control points you know that viewpoint or there's some really cool rocky train over there or these slopes over here are great for beginner train negative control points being okay we got a property line that has neighbors alongside there we know they're not Mm. really keen on this project so let's talk about what our buffer is from the property Mm. or we have a big wetland complex somewhere that we just can't cross but maybe we're putting a boardwalk somewhere so we might have overall kind of a a negative control zone um, but we can maybe put a crossing over one spot so that's a positive Mm -hmm. control point because we know we can put a boardwalk in there so we're we're looking at that high level stuff that forms our trail development zones Mm -hmm. and we get an idea of what mileage might be in there and the types of trails are going to be able to provide and uh, that concept planning really just sets the foundation for next steps in detailed planning and design. But our process, we're, we're asking a ton of questions up front. Mm. You know, we're, we're just wanting to know what the funding stream is, how we're going to maintain the trails, what's the mechanism for that, you know, what's the phases that we're going to try to get into, uh, how does access interface with that, how does your local chapter, just local volunteers work with this project. We're, we're talking with stakeholders from different user groups too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one thing, you know, while we're the International Mountain Biking Association, uh, we plan a lot of shared use trails. We're not just solely mountain bike trails. Mm. 80% of our projects, maybe even more, have a shared use component to them. Yeah. So while we understand that complex user of the mountain biker, we're also engaging with the trail runners, the hikers, the birders, uh, the berry pickers. Right now we're working on a project in Sandpoint, Idaho, and the berry picking there is spectacular. So we're huh. we're talking about how some of those social trails may need to be incorporated or create a development zone or experience zone for, for those users in a mm-hmm. quiet setting. So um, we're, we're reaching out to a lot of different uh, stakeholders in our planning processes. Yeah, interesting. One of the other topics that came up when you and I spoke was signage and wayfinding. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of us have ridden places where, you know, it seems like you're pulling out your map at every intersection or, you know, you just, you never get into a flow because the trails, either because of the way they're laid out or, or maybe it's the signage uh, is lacking. So tell us a little bit about that. Like, how do you think about signage and wayfinding? Are there like best practices or, or, or kind of rules of thumb that you use? We have some rules of thumb, um, and it, it's very much weaved into the experience overall. Um, what does your sign look like as you're coming into the project, you know, or to the to the trail network, like getting to the trailhead? Mm-hmm. Your arrival sequence with signs, and then at the trailhead, you have your your kiosk with your trail network logo or your land manager's logo, and a, a trail map that reads really, really well. Mm-hmm. And you have all your hold harmless language and information on the trails that are ahead of you for mileage and difficulty, providing as much information as you can to the trail user. And then you want to use that as your motif for your signage throughout the whole network. Okay. And, and you hit it on the head. You know, you're pulling out a map. You're pulling out your phone at every intersection. We want to put signage out there in a manner where you don't have to pull out your phone, mm-hmm. that you had the stage set for you at your trailhead kiosk. And then at intersections or major intersections that are hubs, uh, we'll have additional signage. Maybe it's a map insert. 
um, with that you are here dot right. along with really good wayfinding in in the um, network. So Carson Knight Post, maybe it's set 20 feet into the trail from the trail hub. So you know that, okay, just look at the map and I'm going to go ride this trail. Okay, there's a sign for that trail. I'm going to, that's where I know I'm going. Yeah. So we make sure we're just providing great information and uh, uh, not having to pull up maps and phones all the time. Uh, a big piece of it though too is in the design of being conscious of where you're placing intersections and how many intersections that you have. Because mm. uh, intersections, that's where it gives a person a chance to stop, regroup, and pull out their phone. But if you got a ton of intersections, then it's just nonstop stopping. Right. Uh, right. So where does it make sense to actually let's let's cluster a couple of these intersections together because we can go out in these to various directions to get to the zone that we're going for. Mm-hmm. So this reduces the number of intersections in a way that helps your experience flow a little better. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like too, you, you want to have like the right balance between, uh, signs having like enough information, but not an overwhelming amount, right? Like where you could get what you need kind of at a glance. Like if you're not interested in stopping, you just need to go like, Hey, do I, do I go left or right here versus, you know, other people, maybe they need a little more info. They want to orient themselves a bit more or understand like how far it is to the next intersection or, or that sort of thing. So how do you kind of balance that out? Yeah, um, you kind of look at the basics that you want to provide in that information. Okay. Uh, trail length, trail ability level, elevation gain or descend, what's your average slopes. Giving that kind of baseline data that allows people to make the, their informed decisions mm-hmm. and then reinforcing that in a manner that's not uh, information overload when you're on the trail. Yeah. So, again, it's that setting the stage with the kiosk. Uh, map or there's other access points into your trail network. Are you providing that same level of information mm, right. or other access points, and then uh, just reinforcing that throughout the the network experience? Learned a lot actually recently, and this might totally take us down another road of subject matter. But um, <laughs> you know, universal tra- trail access, adaptive trail access. Mm, yeah. Uh, back in November, we had a, a great meeting at the trails that will be opened up in Chattanooga here this coming spring uh, at Walden's Ridge Park in Chattanooga. And uh, we met with a few adaptive riders and talked about uh, what are they looking for in trail networks and how do they get informed about a trail network. Hmm. And the topics ranged all over the place on that, but really came down to is providing information up front that allows the rider or any trail user, that's why you'll say universal trail design, Mm -hmm. but any trail user to read and learn about what's ahead so they can make an informed decision. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and we talked about that as well in another story about like the filter features, right? It's kind of the same idea. It doesn't use a sign, but it's actually like a, you know, some kind of feature at the start of a trail to give people an idea of what lies ahead and, and that sort of thing. Is, is that still something that's, that's pretty common to use? Absolutely. And that starts to hit towards what you mentioned earlier, kind of how we're manipulating. Maybe that's not the right word to use. but <laughs> I like that word. I think that's a great word, but, <laughs> how <laughs> but yeah, it has a connotation. Yeah, yeah. How we're fine-tuning or guided discovery on somebody's experience mm-hmm. is, uh, uh, especially on the more advanced trails, is putting a feature or a move or something at the beginning of the trail that lets them know that this is something that's, they're going to be seeing mm-hmm. ahead. Yeah. And it's still, you see a lot of people getting off the bike and riding around those, but as long as you got the signage mm-hmm. on it saying, Hey, this is uh, what you're going to see ahead and uh, uh, make sure you're riding to your skill level and such. Mm-hmm. But uh, those filter features, uh, squirrel catchers, uh, yeah. chicken lines, you know, all those different things you can talk about, but uh, we'll see those more so in the intermediate to advanced trails. But at the same time, and this is comes out of that, conversation with the adaptive riders. Uh, we met with Joe Stone from Teton Adaptive and Quinn Brett, who works for National Park Service. And uh, we looked at some of those features and how their bikes can uh, navigate those because mm-hmm. they may be more advanced riders. And we were really amazed at how capable their bikes were too. Hmm. Uh, so it really came down to choke points and uh, cross slopes that were exceeding what they could handle without tipping over. Oh, right. Uh, and then uh, the radiuses of churns. But overall, like our beginner trails are inherently accessible. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting to see what, w- what would work or wouldn't work. And even in a bike park setting like Walton's Ridge, um, how their bikes could handle 
uh, a lot of uh, scenarios with uh, very little assistance or a little bit of assistance to get through the trails. Hmm. So those uh, filter features uh, are things to think about when you're providing access for a lot of different users. Or is it purely just a bike optimized trail? You know, we can turn up the the dial on it a little bit, but Mm -hmm. we have accessible riders on that. So maybe it's still something difficult to navigate, but not because it's got a choke on it. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, so speaking about trail difficulties, when you design a new trail system, how do you know what the right mix is in terms of like beginner, intermediate and advanced trails? Seems like, especially experienced riders, their complaint is almost always that there aren't enough advanced trails. So can you talk to us a little bit about like how that decision is made, like what mix to provide and and what plays into that? Yeah. Overall, we'll look at the ability level distribution, kind of like a bell-shaped curve. Okay. Beginner trails are maybe in that uh, 15 to 20% of the uh, trails that are available at that network. Mm -hmm. Intermediate trails, being in that 55 to 65% of uh, trails available there and the remainder in those advanced trails. Um, But if there's a location where we have a lot of trail networks in a tight area Mm -hmm. or small region uh, within a 30 30 minute drive time, uh, we may say, you know, overall the region's really heavy on beginner and intermediate. If this project that we're working on, does it, uh, support more advanced riding. So we may mm-hmm. have a little bit higher percentage of those more advanced uh, features and, and trails. But overall, we're looking at that bell-shaped curve and that's where you do hear some of that feedback on there's not enough advanced riding. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we'll, when we go into a project, we ask those questions. Like, what are we looking to provide here? What do you have existing? What are the goals for experiences? And I've touched on Walden's Ridge a few times, so I'll jump in maybe a little bit here if you don't mind. Yeah. But Walden's Ridge Park in Chattanooga, um, that is a full-on gravity bike park on public lands. Hmm, and wow. uh, it is all intermediate and advanced trails. Okay. Uh, a beginner can ride up one of the climbs and, and descend that shared-use bi-directional climb to go back down. But all the other descending trails are intermediate to very expert trails. Oh, cool. That came out of a trail accelerator grant project that we awarded a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a Tennessee land trust that pur- purchased the private property. And we did planning and design with a lot of private dollars in there too, to develop over 10 miles of bike park, resort style bike park trails there. Mm-hmm. And that's what the IMBA chapter there um Sorba, Chattanooga, they have great networks around chat. Yeah. Uh, a lot of traditional trail networks, mm-hmm. rocky, technical, beginner, flowy, but they didn't really have the gravity experience there in Chattanooga. Uh, and the membership there is like, oh, we want stuff like Windrock or we want mm. like the Riveter or be more bike optimized and jumpy. And so we really uh, pushed the limits for that property. And just by the way of the uh, process that it went through from being private land that was purchased, then private dollars into it and developed it all. Um, we have this really cool gravity bike park that's going to be opening uh, what we believe this coming spring in Chattanooga that will be managed by the county. Hmm. So pretty exciting project there. And that's one where we looked at, okay, you got a lot of great riding around that's available to a lot of different ability levels. And we hear the community wants to be more bike optimized, more jumpy, more mm-hmm gnarly um we did that on that project so pretty exciting i'm looking forward to hearing the public's uh, feedback after they get on those trails there's been a soft opening this past spring with a uh, local uh, membership but uh hasn't been a wide public opening yet so it's gonna be pretty cool oh cool yeah well so you you sort of hinted at it are the the land managers and sometimes like the the funding sources dictating what that that trail difficulty mix is like, I can imagine like a county saying maybe, you know, we want this trail to be available to like everybody, you know, kids and, you know, a whole wide range of people and not just, you know, this super advanced, like aggressive rider. So does that play into it as well? Like, do you have requirements coming in, coming from different groups? Yeah, definitely. Um, when we're working with a public agency, you know, we're hearing from them first, talk about what they foresee for the property. Maybe they already have a master plan in place just for the overall concepts of that property. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, But they, a lot of times they want to hear from the local ridership 
and the other uh, trail users. So we'll do some public engagement, do some public outreach and uh, hear what others are looking for. So we'll ask again, ask a lot of questions and uh, have a lot of input on what folks would like to see along with what's out there already. And that uh, is by a bunch of different stakeholders getting together. That's how we develop the plan. Uh, we're not a consultant that goes out there and shows up for a site visit and then disappears for three months and comes back with a plan. Mm -hmm. um, our process is very collaborative to make sure the land manager is meeting their goals, that we're going to have trails that the, the ridership is going to be engaged with and ride uh, for years on end, mm -hmm. uh, and that those trails are sustainable, not only from like environmentally sustainable lens, but from a fiscal sustainability mm -hmm. and a social sustainability. Uh, we're not going to go out and build that big bike park if there isn't uh, funding in place or organizations in place to maintain it. And uh, maybe this trail network, network really needs to be approachable, accessible by a bunch of different riders and user types and demographics. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll look at making sure it meets all those goals and objectives uh, of sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about that, about sustainability, um, because, you know, obviously a lot of us as riders, we're focused on new trails and we get really stoked when, you know, there's a new trail being built in our area. But obviously, maintenance is super important and something that needs to be considered. So how do you consider that when you're when you're planning a trail? Do you consider it like in terms of the funding or the man hours it's going to take to to keep a trail going or or some of that even part of the design that you can kind of think about that ahead of time? Yeah, all of the above. Um, we're asking the maintenance questions from the get-go. Hmm. Does the county have funding for maintenance? You know, a lot of times these days is no, they don't have the funding for, for that or the staff for it. Yeah. Uh, it's not exciting to raise money for uh, that aspect of a project. It's more exciting to raise the money for the development. Right. So we'll talk about how do we get into a sustainable model for uh, maintenance. It's a memorandum of understanding with the, the local club mm -hmm. um, that's able to do um, the routine maintenance as volunteers. You know, do okay. you have that volunteer base to support that? Uh, if not, let's talk about getting those funding streams in place. And are you hiring staff to maintain the trails? Are you going to pay for a pro builder to come in and do an annual tune-up? Mm. And then your staff can do routine maintenance. Uh, we have a lot of different things available to us, uh, like how we develop a maintenance and operations plan. Uh, so what we're talking about at the planning steps and in design, you know, the sustainable criteria or guidelines that we have with uh, rolling grade dips and rolling contour trail and don't break the rule and uh, all the pieces that are in that trail solutions book you know that that's the foundational piece to uh, make sure they're as environmentally sustainable as we can okay. uh, but then we're, we're talking through like the, the fiscal part of it are we able to uh, maintain these trails with the funds that you have or the volunteer efforts that are nearby um, how can we model for that you know, steamboat springs colorado they passed um, an effort there where a portion of their lodging tax goes towards maintenance Oh, so cool. uh, if a community is really struggling on coming up with funding for that, we'll talk about how can maybe something like that be put together. Yeah. One of the interesting things that you and I talked about um, previously along the, the lines of maintenance is this idea of chip seal trails. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're talking about the same thing, I think this is something that I saw in Bentonville few months ago where, you know, you've got like sort of a, a flowy, like pump track style trail that is actually, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's got asphalt on it. Right. And so it's not a dirt trail that's going to erode or, you know, need a lot of work. Is that uh, something that's becoming more common or is that just kind of like a unique solution that that's occasionally used? Being more common uh, for sure. So doing bike parks fully out of dirt features mm -hmm. Is uh, it takes a lot of maintenance, a lot of yeah. uh, hours and materials and funding to go into that. I would say in the past six or eight years, bike parks and then other trail facilities have been looking at how can hard surface be incorporated into portions of or all of the aspects mm -hmm. of either bike park or portions of trail. So mm -hmm. hard surfaces being less to maintain, more expensive to uh, install. Uh, but right. over time, you know, maybe it, it pencils out. Uh, so chip seal is just another 
evolution of that. So we mm-hmm. were seeing asphalt on pump tracks and asphalt on some trails. We're seeing concrete on some pump tracks. Um, and those both being fairly expensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, right now we're seeing asphalt pump tracks north of $30 a square foot to construct. Yeah, wow. And, uh, uh, concrete. Being, That's as much as like a granite countertop, man. Right. right. <laughs> um, and concrete pump tracks are, are features being, you know, twice that much hmm. rock, rock solid trail contracting is the one that started doing chip seal trails a couple of years ago in Bentonville. Okay. And uh, we've seen that and ridden that and really have uh, um, run with a little bit in some of our projects, especially mm-hmm. in urban settings where you have this much more increased demand for trails that we've seen coming out of the pandemic. Uh, a lot of new riders that don't necessarily know trail etiquette quite yet. Mm-hmm. And folks that want to ride at any time of the year, or any weather. Right. So uh, when you're building trails in, an, especially in an urban setting where there's a lot of riders, those trails can get really, really beat up mm-hmm. uh, during weather events or after. So um, do you put in that chip seal surface less expensive than the asphalt um, has a little bit more of a natural feel than asphalt and uh, is resilient to the, that weather. So the chip seal seems to be coming in around that $7 a square foot. Okay. And rock solid trail contracting, like I mentioned, are the ones that kind of came up with the process or uh, came up with it to apply it to trails. Chip seal has been out there forever on, out on a County road. It's essentially taking right. polymer tar mix, putting it down on the road and then taking rock chips that are like a quarter inch or less and spreading mm-hmm. that out where then it gets embedded in that tar and it gives that, that road a little bit more life is applying that type of process to trails. And you can do it in that dynamic nature of rollers and berms and doubles and add features into it and such. Yeah. So here in Madison did a chip seal. We're calling it the shred to school trail. It connects a park to a school oh, here in cool. Madison. And uh, Rock Solid came in and built it off of a design that we did. And this is one of their northernmost uh, chip seal projects. So we're excited to see how it uh, hmm. handles the, the winter that we're having right now, which we finally have some winter. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we just see it as a really another one of those pieces in the, the toolkit to develop uh, sustainable trails. Yeah. And it's for those who haven't seen it, you know, maybe you're imagining like, a parking lot. Um, but you know, the ones that, that I rode in Bentonville are very well integrated into the trail system. Kind of, as you mentioned, you know, I mean, you're riding along dirt single track and then, Oh, here's a section of, of chip seal trail. That's, you know, got good rollers in it and berms and things. And the best thing in my opinion is they keep their shape like forever, you know, the builder Mm -hmm. sets that shape in and and that's it. And like you said, it doesn't require a lot of maintenance or rebuilding or, you know, weather doesn't seem to affect it as much. And yeah, it's a lot of fun and it feels, feels pretty natural because it does flow into like the rest of the trail system. Yeah. Yeah. And that chip rock that you use typically comes from local sources. So the color of it matches the surrounding Um, rock and uh, dirt and such. So it's not super intrusive and yeah, it sits in the the landscape pretty naturally. Um, Talking with Aaron at rock solid talks about how maybe if a berm does fail or maybe a future just wasn't quite laid out, right. Mm -hmm. You you can almost cut that stuff out like carpet, roll it back, (laughs) reshape the feature. You're not going to roll it back on, but you're just going to come back in and lay down those two new lifts of chip seal. And then off you go. Wow. So, uh, um, it's still early in that application, but uh, uh, we're seeing a lot of value in it. Yeah, super interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, speaking of kind of the cost of building trails, how does the cost of building trails today compare to, say, 10 years ago or, or 20 years ago? Are trails, mm. is that trending at all? Or like even more recently, is inflation affecting that? Or, or what are you seeing for trail building costs? Definitely. Uh, inflation has for sure impacted that here in the past uh uh, 12 months and uh, mm. a trend from 20 years ago to now is uh, more expensive. Mm-hmm. I'd say a lot more when you kind of talk in the dollars of 20 years ago, you might've said, Oh, mile of trail is going to cost you $15,000 a mile to build. Mm-hmm. Um, but now for a, maybe say a, a general bike optimized single track that's machine built is going to cost you around $65,000 a mile to build. Whoa. Wow, uh, could be could be a lot higher, could be maybe a little bit less, but that's kind of a good baseline number to start with. Mm-hmm. But what impacts that is 
how thick the vegetation is. Are you taking trees out or not? Um, what are your slopes? What are your soils? How much rock content? What are all the things that factor into your production rates? How much trail can you get built in a day? Yeah. And then, uh, then applying all the costs that you need to, to that, your, your hourly pay, your machine rentals or just machine ownership materials that you're importing uh, and coming up with what your production rate is for that trail type. And we may have mm -hmm. five trail types on a project on different cross slopes, or maybe we're um, doing some rock armoring on one and another we're not. So uh, rock armoring takes uh, a little bit longer than tr traditional trail tread. Mm. Uh, that project at uh, Walton's Ridge in Chattanooga, that was north of $100,000 a mile oh, wow. that we built uh, more towards, I think, uh, $120,000 a mile. But that was six foot wide, eight foot wide, big features, step up, step down, super rocky chunder on some other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so that takes time to, to build. And we'll have trails where we'll do a hybrid construction of working volunteers and our, our pro crew out there. You may have some cost savings, but not necessarily um, a lot of cost savings there. It's more about kind of engaging the hearts and minds of the volunteers and getting that community built around the trails. Yeah. Uh, we'll also embed county staff or land manager staff into a build crew so they get you know, trained up on how to maintain those trails afterwards. Hmm. So those different models impact uh, how much it will cost to, to build those trails. Yeah. So would you say there are enough experienced sort of quality mountain bike trail builders in the U.S. right now? Is Does that drive the cost in terms of like if you have enough crews available or kind of where are we right now in terms of our, our trail building capacity? We need a lot more builders, uh, especially need uh, experienced operators. But the toughest thing is you become yeah. experienced by jumping in a machine and, and gaining that experience. Hmm. Um, yeah, we could do another day or two podcasts on just the <laughs> Um, state of the industry, but uh, mm -hmm. you know the industry overall we're um, under capacity because of the demand that's out there for trails. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of great builders out there, from small owner operator companies to to big companies like Rock Solid and Single Tracks, who have you know well over sixty employees. Yeah. Uh, just the tough thing right now is just getting experienced operators, and uh, how do you train those folks? Uh, is there certification for builders? Uh, how do we get everybody up to a baseline standard, you know, of quality uh, build out there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, bid packages that go up from organizations that might just be lowest price um, award, uh, yeah. but we like to see at least the, the lowest uh, quality uh, mm -hmm. builder uh, choice out there. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see what's happening across the U S and it's, it's good to see new build companies popping up that are doing great work. So um, we're, we're coming around. We're a really young industry when it, you compare it to other trades out there. Right. Uh, you know, electricians or plumbers or contractors you know, have been around for a long time compared to trail building, special trail builders. You know, that's something well, as recent as just the, the mid nineties or later. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned that trail solutions has three crews, like how far out are they usually booked? I mean, if, if a community like had money and, and plans and they're ready to go and they wanted to hire, a trail solutions build crew, like when's the earliest they could get on that calendar? A uh, lot of the answers I give is it depends. <laughs> depends how much money, how many millions are you willing to give us? We'll move you up. Yeah. What's your build window for the season that makes sense to be building in? Right. What's the size of your project? Um, smaller project, we can probably fit you in sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Big project that is going to take us all summer long somewhere. You might be a year or more out. It's cyclical. Mm -hmm. Right now we have some availability in our, our 23 calendar. Oh, um, cool. We've had some projects that kind of move, move around. One got delayed. One, we kind of changed course on how it's going to be implemented. Uh, so we got some availability, but I know other builders out there our book solid for for 23 hmm. uh last year we had booked out our 22 build season probably about 18 months before we got into oh, wow. the 22 season so it's all about timing we like to see requests for proposals to come to us early in the year not like in may saying we want to start building a trail on june 1 so if you're out there looking at get a trail project going. It's uh, engaging early and often yeah. and being aware that you may not be uh, in sync with uh, the timing for some builders and their availability. 
Right. Yeah, it makes sense too. The seasonality of it, in terms of, I mean, the build season is is pretty limited. So I imagine winter is a good time for you guys to be looking at those those RFPs and and starting to plan out stuff for the summer when you're you are super busy. Mm -hmm. Ideally, yes. It seems like we're super busy all the time. (laughs) You know, we're we're building trails down south in the winter, but we've typically been having our builders take time off in December and January Mm -hmm. and then back at it in February. So we have crews uh, ramping up here in a few weeks, going to be in uh, West Virginia doing another phase of build at Cape and State Park. So yeah, we we keep pretty busy uh, year round. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, let's, let's talk about some of the the bike projects and and trails that you're stoked about. We mentioned Walden's Ridge, uh, the project in Chattanooga that's, that's wrapping up, um, should be open soon. That bill wrapped up uh, actually last year, just take some time to transfer it to the county, mm-hmm. uh, to, be open to the public. Uh, so I've talked about that one a bit. What I just mentioned there, Cacapin State Park in West Virginia, that was one of our trail accelerator grant projects that we did the initial planning on, mm-hmm. uh, jumped into design there. And this past year built, it's around about a mile long, a fully rock armored downhill trail experience. Oh, cool. And, and that one's pretty special too, because we uh, partnered with a youth conservation corps to build that trail. Hmm. So we had two of our experienced builders uh, between Joey Klein and Chris Orr lead youth builders who are learning to, about the trade and they're usually doing uh, shared use trails or just hiking trails is pretty exciting for mm-hmm. crews to be in doing bike optimized bike only trail. And we had a few different com- crews come through in the summer. So that was really pretty awesome. And it, that opened up this past fall and I've heard a lot of great things on that trail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. So that's a model that we see every now and then is working with youth conservation corps. We, man, it's fun to talk about the construction projects, right? We got a lot of planning yeah. projects in the mix, but you know, recently constructed stuff. We just finished up a project in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, Mandan City Park. Hmm. And uh, that is a park that was really just underutilized in an underserved neighborhood and uh, built out some beginner trail there that's just can be really engaging for the the community so that's going to open up the spring uh, we continue to do work in cedar city utah so um okay. there in cedar city we initially did a trails plan for that back oh man probably almost 10 years ago maybe eight years ago 100 mile trail plan hmm. and we've been building trail every year there for the past six seven years wow. and there's over 30 miles of trail there now that uh the local nika Kids are out there racing and maintaining trails. Hmm. Iron Trail Craft um, is the uh, Imba local chapter there that is uh, maintaining and uh, building additional trail. And that was done in partnership with the Bureau of Land Management and uh, really awesome partnership with that federal agency. So Cedar City continues to grow. We did a project down in Anniston, Alabama a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. adjacent to Coldwater Mountain, where some trails were built uh, 10 years ago or so. But this is fully a, a NICA-driven project at McClellan, which used to be a uh, army base. Mm-hmm. And the uh, ordinances got cleared from there, and there's great road access all over the place. So we developed a state championship course there in McClellan. So that, that was a really fun project uh, for the, the group down there. Uh, man, I could go on and on. We got projects in Dallas, Texas right now, really big bike park we're working on. Oh, cool. Uh, in Frisco, Texas. Um, that's a 120 acre park that has some existing trails on it right now, but it's being turned into a, a regional size park that's going to have a lot of park amenities. So, uh, public green space, amphitheater, uh, small dog park, uh, splash pad, things like that. But there's mm-hmm. trails integrated throughout the whole plan. So, we got some free ride trails in a zone that we're developing. We'll have a perimeter trail that we're looking at doing the entire thing out of chip seal. So there's going to be a combination of natural surface trails, some asphalt skills development trails, and big asphalt pump track, and then some of those chip seal trails too. So yeah, bike park projects are pretty hot right now on the planning and design side. We have a couple others going on in uh, Sioux City, Iowa. Cone Park is one that's going to go out to bid here soon. Working with the uh, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in Cherokee, North Carolina mm-hmm. on a bike park project. That one hopefully we'll see get some construction done this coming summer uh, with a pump track, a couple actually a couple of pump tracks, some cool free ride trails on that. So that's fun. One of my favorites that we wrapped up this past summer was uh, well, we'll continue hopefully in the next couple of years too, is up at Arapahoe Basin Ski Resort. So not necessarily a community-based uh, 
not a community based project, but uh, we just completed a high alpine loop. It's all above tree line, mm-hmm. building off of a couple phases um, before that. So that's going to be not lift served. It's kind of earn your turns, um, some yeah. big climbs, but some really cool bike optimized descents. And now this big loop that goes above the the beavers, which is a new recent ski expansion that was done there. So we worked there with uh, their trail build crew, which we've trained up over the past couple of years. And they've went out and bought a mini excavator and they had one of their own teams going while we had a team going, we kind of did the golden spike mm. at the end of the season, uh, connecting everything together. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of fun stuff going on. Yeah. Really cool. So yeah, I mean, you mentioned like a diverse list of projects and one of the themes, well, with a few of those was, was NICA. Um, in terms of like high school athletes and the need for those athletes to have a place to ride and to train. And then also the other side that you're mentioning, a lot of these projects seem sort of tourism based. So I'm interested to know from your perspective, when you're building or planning new trails, is it more of like a, like a push or a pull? Like, is it community saying we have riders, we have people that are interested in this. And so we need trails or is it a community where where they're saying we we want people to come here and we want to we want to bring riders in or, or you know kind of grow the sport through trails? So so which which comes first? Does the sport grow first or do do we build trails first? <laughs> That's a good chicken the egg question, huh? We see a good mix of both, but I would say if there was a majority, it's probably the we want to build trails for our community. Mm. We have folks here that ride, but they got to drive 45 minutes or two hours or more to go get to trails. Yeah. So we, we want to have something here that makes our community more, more healthy, mm-hmm. engaging for uh, the community, maybe some underserved aspects of their community that folks that aren't traditionally outdoor recreation minded, mm-hmm. making those opportunities available. And then from there, once you have the community access and community trails growing, then you start to turn into a destination of some sorts, depending on the scale and size of the networks that you're developing. But then we also get the ones uh, that say, hey, we see that mountain bike is a huge thing going on here. We think we've got some really cool terrain. We don't really have any ridership yet, but we're in a zone that we think would be really good. So well, can we look at doing a trails plan? Let's do a feasibility study and see what we have for available lands and what you would mm-hmm. recommend for first phases in, in trail development. Yeah. Um, we're seeing it's really being leveraged for retaining a healthy workforce and recruiting mm. um, young professionals to locations or just uh, um, just workforce in general on uh, you know, just getting people into your community and keeping them around. Because we now know that people want to live where they play, not necessarily uh, live where they work. Right. Yeah. 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 But when you can mix the two together, you can live, work and play now with a lot of remote access work. Uh, it it uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think if, as long as mountain biking is growing, that we'll continue to have sort of more demand for trails and and that it'll continue on that trajectory? I believe so. I kind of look at it how back in the late eighties and early nineties and on where like every community was asking for a skate park (laughs) and skate skate parks are kind of one sport minded, but everybody wanted it because they saw how it grew and built community around it. And you had some yeah. BMXers in there and some rollerbladers in there, scooters, whatever else. Now with uh, bike access and uh, more cl- trails close to home focus that IMBA has, and it's even the, overall the industry is looking at doing that, at providing great trail access for communities. You could say that almost follows kind of the same trend. It's almost hard to deny that any community could have – three miles of trail or so or more right. depending on their, their terrain. So trail access, I can see us uh, having a high demand for it for, for a while. I'm sure it will uh, plateau or maybe uh, tail off a little bit. Um, maybe it seems like skate parks have tailed off at one time, but they kind of ebb and flow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I see trail access being strong for a while. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, Mike, uh, thanks for taking the time to chat with us and, and fill us in on trail design and definitely keep us posted on, on all the new projects. We always love hearing about new trails and, and new ideas. Absolutely. Happy to uh, visit with you here and uh, yeah, keep an eye out on our trail accelerator grant page on our website, along with our trails labs. Uh, that's a way that we get resources out to um, not only our, our IMBA chapters, but just uh, general land managers or bike advocates, trail advocates across the board. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So yeah, more information at imba.com and we'll have a link to it in the show notes. That's all we've got this week. Talk to you again next week.